Hey everyone, I'm Jen Adams. Today we're going to be learning about scientific illustration with our friend Croatia. Hi Jen. Hey Croatia. So good to see you. You too. Hey, I wanted to pass this on to you. This is um, one of Roger Roy Peterson's field guides to birds and insects. There's so many drawings in here. These are great examples of scientific illustration. What do you mean by scientific illustration? Well, scientific illustration is a artistic and scientific discipline uh, whose purpose is to synthesize information for a specific audience. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, so today we're diving into observational drawing skills. There's two guests, special guests today, mm -hmm. uh, that I think we should go meet. Let's go meet them. Okay, let's do it. Oh, hi, friends. Hello. So again, this is the big surprise. These are our two special guests. We have Kyle here, who is a science educator at Toronto. Kyle, who do you have with you today? This is Sparky, a great horned owl. Sparky is the oldest animal we have at our uh, aviary there. He's 25 years old, which is fairly old for a great horned owl, and he's the largest owl we're going to see in Maine year round. Kyle, can you tell us a little bit about how Sparky came to Toronto? Yeah, Sparky came in way back in 1994. He was injured, and when he healed up, he didn't heal quite correctly. So all the animals that we have in our aviary, they're here because they have a physical or social handicap that prevents them from surviving in the wild. If they were healthy and could go back to the wild, we wouldn't have them living until wild. So because they are not able to survive, we give them a home here. They make great teachers and educators, and now models for your class too. And we are so grateful to have Sparky here to work with us. It is time for us to get started with some drawing. Jen, I have your supplies right here, and I set you up with a drawing station over there at the table. Perfect. And now it's time for me to get my workstation ready. Now that I have my workspace set up and ready, and I can see my subject the entire time that I'm sketching, I'm ready to get started. It is important to know that there are five fundamental steps for a successful illustration. So let's start here with the first one. The first step is to locate the major shapes of your subject. When I look at Sparky, I definitely see some triangles. I know that I see a triangle right at the top part of his head. And so I'm gonna start here by getting some major shapes. And I kind of see an oval with the rest of his body and another bit of a triangle here with his tail. So I would say that overall, this is the major shape that I'm looking at. So once you have your overall shape, we need to start to look at the smaller shape. And like I had mentioned, Sparky has sort of this triangular head. And so with straight edges, keeping it angular, I'm gonna go ahead and try and put in that shape. I, I see also there's a bit of a rectangle here, and I see a wing here, which is also triangular. And I'm noticing now that I didn't quite get this big wing off the back of him. There's also a bit of a tuft here that is also sort of triangular. And then again, the tail. So Kyle, it, I keep noticing that Sparky looks a little bit like he's panting. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, you might notice right now that his mouth is open, his head's forward, and every so often that throat's gonna flutter. So it's called a gula flutter, and you're exactly right. It's basically panting, like a dog or cat that can't cool down. He can't sweat like you and I, and so that tongue's drawing air back and forth to cool himself down. It's a little warmer and beautiful the outside. He's also getting ready to cast a kite and seeing opening his mouth a little wider, so that's very exciting. So now that we've gotten the big shapes, the littler shapes, and we've kept straight edges for the most part, because straight edges are easier for the eye to see, now we want to make sure our proportions are correct. I like to use a pencil almost like a ruler visually. And I'll take my pencil and I'll hold it towards the subject. And I'll notice here, if I use my pencil, that the width of Sparky's head is equal to almost, it's two heads wide of his body. So if I look at his head and I take that down, I can say, okay, whatever side I make this head here, I need to have two widths of that head here for his body width. And so that means that my measurement is a little off and I actually need to make this much larger in the back to make sure my proportions are a little bit more accurate. I could do that again with the length of my subject. I could look at his head, pretty much the top of his head where his beak is, and I can start to measure. One head equals one, two, 
three, four heads in height. That looks accurate, so I'll leave it the way it is. So now it's time to move into making these straight edges into curved lines, which are a little bit more accurate as to what we see in nature. So I'm gonna first look at the top of the head and how it connects to the neck and the shoulders. And then I'm gonna go ahead and continue to create those curved lines throughout the composition. This is a good time also to now to begin the curved features of the eyes, the brow, the beak, and also to make sure that I've included the talons. There's some nice curved lines there. So the next step is to organize this a little bit um, and to remove some of those preliminary shapes we created just to get a good sense of what we were working with. So now I need to go in and begin to take out some of these extra lines that I don't really need anymore in my composition. Great. So this is where we get to do the really fun stuff. Now it's time to move in to the highlights, the shadows, and any textures and details that we want to include in our composition. So notice the uh, shape of the head there. That round disc of darker colors around the face is called a facial disc, and that's essentially what the owl's ear is. They don't have ears like you and I. Those little parts on top are called plumicorns. And they might look like ears, but they're just feathers to break up the shape. That really unique patterning that you can see along the feathers is due to this cryptic camouflage. Every feather is banded with different colors of dark and light, light browns, tans and whites and blacks that allow the feathers to mix in a mosaic that blends into the bark of the trees, making them have naturally wonderful camouflage. I see a lot of detail going into those curved, sharp talons which are the primary source of how this owl is grabbing its prey. To be a successful owl, you need two good eyes to see your food, two good wings to carry you there, and two good feet with those sharp talons for grasping and squeezing the life out of that prey. Now that uh, most of the details, the embellishments, the values have been added, it's time to uh, possibly think of a darker tool to use to really work on pulling this subject off the page, making it feel a little bit more three-dimensional. So, uh, Those little parts on top are called plumicorns. They might look like ears, but they're just feathers to break up the shape. They are carnivores and predators, and they're only hunting rodents and small game or out in the woods. They're going to grab with tremendous grip strength, about ten times stronger than you, five to six times stronger than an adult, and they're going to use that beak to rip and tear into small pieces kind of like you might use a knife and fork to cut up a steak to eat. Once you feel like your composition is in a, a good place and you're finished, you can choose to leave it as a black and white composition, sort of a monochromatic theme, or you can choose to embellish it with watercolor, paint, markers, completely up to you. I'm gonna go in and do a little bit of coloring um, in the eyes, and I can't find the exact color I want, so I'm gonna do a combination. Well, the eyes are a, a golden yellow color, and they can sometimes look orange in different light. Our great horned owl is one of the smallest eagle owls, and others in other countries will have a deeper orange eye. But no one's really sure why exactly those eyes are bright yellow, uh, and some owls that are dark brown. It's kind of like our eye color. There's no benefit to them being that golden yellow color. I'm almost finished. I'm not quite there. But when I do finish, I plan to photograph my final composition and send that in to Chilonki Camp at Home. And uh, there are pro tips for how to do those photographs uh, on the link. And I encourage all of you to share the work that you create and your process. Let us know what uh, your subject was that you drew from. Thank you so much for joining us today. Croatia, thank you for teaching us about scientific illustration. And Kyle and Sparky, thanks for being our special guests. We're so excited to see what you send us and how your scientific drawings turned out. See you next time.